time, you can always stop me and either using the chat or just asking the question, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so when I was thinking about making this presentation, um, I was thinking about how I wanted to do it. And we have a lot of really good information on our website. So I kind of wanted to um, be switching between the PowerPoint and the website so that you can see uh, where a lot of this information lives so that later on, if you're, um, you know, we're closed over the weekend and uh, you have just a, a burning financial aid question, you can just log right into the website uh, um, to check it out. So first of how to apply for aid. So here's our main website here. Is everyone able to see that? Awesome. Um, so here's our main website here. Um, we kind of have some of the things of applying for aid, finding scholarships, um, com uh, completing forms, and then dates and deadlines. Um, but we'll start here on how to apply for aid. So um, when applying for aid, you always want to plan ahead, thinking about which semester you're wanting to start in um, and what that means as far as what you need to complete in order to have your finances in order to, to have a successful start to that semester. Um, within this, we have our important dates and deadlines, um, which you guys, if you guys have uh, important uh, specific dates and deadlines, uh, that you have questions about, I'd be happy happy to answer. Um, but when we come to this page, uh, we have it broken down by semester. So if you knew which semester you were wanting to start with um, or continue in, um, you could visit these and, and, and look at those dates and deadlines. Um, above and beyond that, once you have done, uh, done the planning, you'll want to apply for aid. Um, this would be things like filling out the FAFSA, looking for scholarships, um, potentially looking for uh, other types of loans, which we'll be going into the um, all of the different types of aid that we have later on in this presentation. Um, and then after that, when you apply for aid, you'd want to complete any holds or to-dos that are on your account, um, which you would be able to see um, on your My Boise State. Um, I'm not sure, is, is, it, uh, is everyone uh, on the Zoom, are, are you all students already or are you um, some prospective students? Awesome. Cool, so you should uh, have access to your account and hopefully you're checking it out. Um, we also send a lot of um, information directly to your Bronco mail, that's your student email as well. So um, if you're not, it's definitely good practice to just uh, keep an eye out on your student center um, and your Bronco mail, because um, that's just the main way that the university uh, sends that communication in general. Um, and then once you have your aid, you may need to accept your aid. So this could be potentially like student loans that you may need to be accepted. Uh, I think a good uh, distinction here is that just because you have the aid, it doesn't mean that you have to accept it, um, especially when it comes to student loans. Our goal is to um, have students have um, as little and I mean, ideally no debt um, once uh, being done with, with with getting their degree. But unfortunately, that, that just can't happen and we understand that. But um, if you're able to, um, definitely don't, if you don't need them, definitely don't take out the loans, but um, it's not all, uh, either an all or nothing thing either. So um, if you're offered a certain amount, let's just say $10,000 um, and you actually only want 5,000, you can totally do that um, within your student center and accept just that smaller amount. Um, and then receiving and maintaining your aid. So um, that means you might have to redo an application year after year. Um, if you're getting financial aid that's above and beyond what your tuition is, you may want to set up direct deposit. Um, if you're expecting to get a refund um, as a direct deposit is uh, a much faster way than just getting a paper check in the mail. <coughs> awesome. So we, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so we had the how to apply for aid. Um, within that, I just did want to kind of cover uh, some of the processes that we have to, to potentially change uh, the information that you have to submit when applying for aid. So for example, this current FAFSA that we're on for this fall and for next spring is based off of 2018 tax information. 2018 was a while ago and a lot of things have changed since then. Um, and one of those things that may have changed for students could potentially be the amount of income that they're that they're earning now. So if that is uh, where you are in um, uh, a situation that you're in, you could look at submitting a special conditions to our office where we could review what your current situation is and we may be able to 
um, go into your FAFSA and make changes on the amount of, uh, on what's being reported to potentially give you better financial aid. So um, we have a couple of different options of how you could do that. Um, we have information about that on our website, but if you're curious about what might be the best option for you or if it would make um, uh, any difference at all, you can always set up an appointment um, with our staff and we'd be happy to, to, to go through your specific circumstances with you. All right, so moving on to types of aid. So the types of aid that we have here is we have grants. Uh, typically when we're talking about grants, we're talking about Pell Grants. Uh, these would be through the FAFSA. Um, that's the free application for federal student aid through the Department of Education. Um, so by filling out that FAFSA and putting in your information is what's going to determine whether you'd be eligible for Pell Grant or not. Um, not everyone's eligible for it, but how you determine if you are or not is by filling out the FAFSA. Um, we have scholarships. Um, we have some admissions scholarships. We have uh, the Boise State scholarship application that actually is live now. So if you're planning on uh, attending fall 2021, spring 2022, uh, I would definitely fill out that scholarship application. Um, the, the major deadline for that is going to be February 15th. Um, so that's open and, and ready to fill out. Um, we have work study, which is also through the FAFSA. Uh, it's kind of an interesting award because when you accept it, it's, you, you, you don't just get it like a scholarship or a grant or a loan. Um, you would actually have to get a job, uh, typically on campus, uh, where you would be working um, at a specific uh, pay rate, and then you would earn on that award as you worked. So if you didn't work at all and you had a $5,000 work study award, it's actually a $0 work study award um, because you, you need to work to earn on it. Um, but that is also through the FAFSA. So it would be through filling that FAFSA out. Um, there's 529 plans. These are education plans. Uh, we do have one through the state of Idaho. Um, so you may want to, you know, if you had personal funds or, you know, Christmas is coming up, if what you desire was to have, you know, people help pay for tuition, you could potentially set up a 529 plan and share with people um, like what that what that plan link is and they can uh, put money in there and sometimes uh, they could even use that as a tax write off so um, you know if your grandma is potentially uh, giving you uh, money through the 529 plan it could potentially be more beneficial for her to give the money through the 529 plan if you're using it for education than to just pay for education directly um, and then the last one that we have here is loans. Again, this is um, the least desirable type of financial aid uh, as, you, as they do have to be paid back, um, but it is still um, something that can be helpful um, and could really uh, be beneficial if you're looking at it as an investment to uh, potentially earn more um, in the future. So um, before I move on, are there any questions so far of what I've covered? Awesome. So we kind of have covered all those different types of aid. There's a lot of writing on the slide, but basically um, what's important to know is that there's a lot of federal aid um, that has yearly and lifetime limits on it. So when it comes to the Pell Grant, typically what that means is six full-time years or 12 full-time semesters. If you do not have your degree within that time, um, you may run out of Pell Grant and have to look for other types of financial aid. Um, the student loans, they also have um, annual limits. So there's a, spe a specific amount that you can take out per year. And then they also have lifetime limits. So if you reach your lifetime limit, um, that means that you would not be able to receive federal financial aid, at least when it comes to loans, um, for the remaining of your lifetime within that uh, type of degree. Um, not a bunch of people hit this limit, but it's really important to be aware of, especially when it comes to uh, making plans of how you're gonna pay for your education um, and making sure that you have enough um, aid uh, to, to reach whatever goal you're trying to accomplish. 
So ways to fill the gap. So if you are um, fill out the FAFSA and you're not receiving enough financial aid to uh, cover what you need, and again, that might be that might be more than just tuition. It might be um, financial aid as well that's needed to help pay for uh, for rent or for food or transportation or school supplies or books. Um, so if you're needing some some additional uh, funds above and beyond what what, what you currently have. Um, really what you would be looking at uh, would be potentially a parent plus one if you're a dependent student, which means you're including your parents on the FAFSA. Um, if you're not doing that, then it would be looking at potentially private loans um, or other scholarships, private scholarships. Um, so those are just kind of other ways that you can fill in those gaps. Uh, and if you have questions about that, um, we can definitely help you out with that. But I mean, really, I think those private loans are kind of... Uh, um, kind of a last resort because they typically are very high interest rates um, and don't have um, a lot of the same protections that exist when it comes to the federal loans. Um, but but they are out there and it may it's not a bad choice um, for for all people. So all right, managing your aid. So, I mean, this is kind of uh, what I already covered of um, it being just important to check your student center and your Bronco mail, just making sure that uh, your account's still up to date and that um, it is where you're, where, where you're expecting it um, to be at and, and, and that you're all set to receive your financial aid. Within that, uh, when you submit your FAFSA, about 30% of students are selected for verification. Uh, what that means is that you would have to submit additional documents to Boise State before you could receive your federal funds. These items, again, would be sent to you through email. They would be sent to you on your student center. But uh, we receive a lot of questions that say, oh, hey, I filled out my FAFSA. How come I don't have any financial aid on my account? And sometimes the answer is, well, you're, you've been selected for verification and you haven't completed any of those to-do items. Uh, the verification process, especially when uh semesters are about to start can be very slow just because we're receiving so many documents uh so really hopefully you're done with verification a month at least a month before uh classes begin um just so that can be uh taken care of and and you, and you can have financial aid um set and ready to go by the time tuition is due um, accepting or declining your aid, we kind of discussed uh, um, about that. You don't have to accept the full amount. You don't have to accept any of it. Um, but if you are wanting loans, we never accept them on your behalf uh, because you do have to pay, repay those loans. So um, if you are wanting them um, and they're on your account, you may need to go um, out and, and accept them. Uh, similarly, if you have like a Boise State scholarship that you've been um, awarded through the scholarship application, you may need to go in and accept it. So. Um, sometimes when you've been awarded financial aid, there's still additional steps that you need to do in order to actually receive it. Um, and then that's kind of going over that, that, that same information. Yes, yeah, so we kind of already went over the verification process, um, but if you are filling out a FAFSA, there is an option to do what's known as the IRS data retrieval tool. What this does is it links your information from the IRS directly to your FAFSA. If you do that, your chances of getting selected for verification go down significantly um, because it's information provided directly for the IRS. It also makes filling out your FAFSA a lot easier because a lot of the questions are filled in automatically um, if you're able to do that data retrieval tool. Um, so if you're filling out your FAFSA and you have the option to do the data retrieval tool, I would highly recommend doing that. Um, and then when students are selected for verification, the forms that we typically ask for, we have a household size and um, number in college form, um, asking for tax information, and then uh, either you or your, if you're a dependent, your, your, your current marital status. Um, if things have changed with your marital status, you're, you're now married or you're no longer married, um, your chances of being selected for verification go way up 
Um, and there's definitely um, some processes within that verification that can make it make it be a lot slower. Like if we're not sure if you're married and then you tell us that you are married, we may then need further information beyond that. So um, if you have a marital status change and you're selected for verification, definitely start that process sooner rather than later. Um, I think that's true for any student that's selected for verification, but that's extra true uh, for students that have a marital status change or if their parents have a marital status change. So we let students know about the verification they're selected through, again, through their email and on their student center. Um, this is kind of just showing uh, a screenshot of what you may see if you have to do's or holds on your account. Um, and by clicking into here, it will show you uh, what those are. If you are selected for verification, you need to submit to, uh, documentation to us. Um, you can submit that through mail, fax, email, or in person. Um, of course, the in-person one is really um, kind of up in the air. That can change at any time right now. Um, but the email, fax, and, and, and the U.S. mail will, will all work. Um, there's actually been an update uh, just really recent. Um, on this slide, it says that if the document has your full social, um, that it can't be submitted by via, it can't, it can't be submitted via email. Uh, that has actually changed. If you redact your social, uh, from let's say like your tax return, we can accept it through email now. Um, we ask that you just keep the last four on so that we can um, better identify uh, who you are. Um, so that part, th that section has changed. Um, that was, I think, as of yesterday. So, <laughs> all right. Any questions uh, so far on what's been covered? Cool. So we'll move on to the impacts on aid. So you receive financial aid, um, and then there's things that may impact uh, what types of financial aid that you receive. Um, so the first one is your cost of attendance. The cost of attendance is basically the average cost to attend Boise State. So this includes things like tuition, room and board, transportation, books, uh, medical expenses, um, and we create a, an average cost of attendance. That doesn't necessarily mean what you'll be facing. You, you're, what you're facing for the year may be um, larger and may be smaller. The example that I always like to provide is if you are eating prime rib every night, your food cost is gonna be much more than if you're eating ramen every night. So, I mean, we put the average in there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what you would be facing. Uh, but we cannot give you financial aid above your cost of attendance. So if you're hitting your cost of attendance and financial aid, um, that's, that's the amount that you're getting. Uh, we do have uh, ability, uh, of course, to make changes um, through a budget increase form. And if you have questions about that, you can always reach out to our office and uh, we'd be happy to help you. The next thing that, was there a question? Uh, well, no, I was, uh, maybe there's a question uh, that may come up, but um, is that any different if you're an on-campus student, how that, that's calculated, whether you're an on-campus student or an, a fully online student? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, as far as your tuition, I'm not sure you're uh, in your programs, are they all like standard programs or are they self-support programs? Uh, so the online programs are in a different fee model. Um, mm -hmm. But is it calculated just differently as far as like your, you know, your food or your, you know, personal living expenses just because it's an online program or? So no, um, what we do is, is based upon your FAFSA answer. So when you fill out the FAFSA and you say that you're coming to Boise State, it's going to ask you what your housing plans are. Are you going to be living on campus, off campus, or with a parent? Um, the only thing that really makes a big change is if you say with a parent, because the assumption is, is that you're not, like if you're living with your parents, that you're not, not facing as much um, charges for rent or for food. Um, so those ones are, 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 are hugely different, um, but it's based upon your FAFSA answer, not what program you're attending at Boise State. Um, I think like if you're living on campus versus off campus, uh, I think our on-campus cost of attendance is maybe like 
$300 bigger than our on-campus, than our off-campus one. Um, and just when we were doing research, it appeared that on-campus housing uh, on average was more expensive than off-campus housing. Um, so that's the reason why it's, it's not based upon the program that a student is in. But again, if your housing that you're facing for whatever reason is higher, if your tuition is higher um, than the average that we have in, uh, in place, um, and you're hitting your cost of attendance, we have ways that we can increase it. Uh, the next thing that can uh, affect the type uh, um, of financial aid that you're receiving is your expected family contribution. This is the number that's generated by the FAFSA. So this number determines whether you're going to get Pell Grant or not. If it's over a certain threshold, you won't get Pell Grant. It will also determine whether you're eligible for work study, whether you're eligible for subsidized loans or not which are better than unsubsidized loans because they don't gain interest uh, while you're in school. So um, that uh, expected family contribution can, can definitely have an effect on what type of financial aid that you receive. The next thing that can affect uh, the type of financial aid you receive is your enrollment. So if you're a half-time student, your cost of attendance is lower than if you're a full-time student. If you're only taking one PE class, your cost of attendance is going to be very, very small versus if you're a, a full-time student. Um, so when we typically award financial aid, we award it uh, usually always based on the assumption that you're going full-time. So if you're not, what that means is you might have a reduction in your financial aid um, once we make the adjustments closer to the semester starting. Satisfactory academic progress, this is a big one that can affect your financial aid. If you are not meeting satisfactory academic progress, which um, we always just short down to SAP, if you are not meeting the SAP standards, you are no longer eligible for federal financial aid without doing um, an appeal. Uh, there's, there's three standards that have to be met. I think it's on the, on the PowerPoint. So when we go back to the PowerPoint, we'll, we'll cover those really quick. Changes in finances, we've kind of already talked about that, that the FAFSA right now is based off of 2018 tax information. If your finances have changed, we could look at making changes to your FAFSA to, you know, if you're not eligible for Pell Grant, we could make a change and maybe you, you would be eligible for Pell Grant if um, the changes in your finances are, are drastic enough. Um, limits on A, we, we talked about that. There's the annual and, and the um, lifetime limits. Um, and then we'll go back to this part. So the three standards that have to be met for satisfactory academic progress are there the GPA standard, the pay standard, and the maximum time frame standard. Uh, the GPA standard for undergraduate students is a 2.0 GPA. So as long as you're above a 2.0 GPA for uh, your cumulative GPA, you won't have to worry about that standard. If you're below it, you could have a hold placed on your account. Uh, the pace percentage, it's a 67% completion rate. What that means is it's the amount of credits you've completed over the amount of credits that you've attempted. So if you've completed 60 credits and, and have attempted 100, your pace percentage would be 60% and you would be below the standard. If you've completed 80 and attempted 100, your completion rate would be 80% and you would be meeting the standard. As long as you're above that 67%, you'll be fine to continue receiving financial aid. The last... Um, a uh, standard is a max time frame standard. For undergraduate students, what that means is you have 180 credits to get your degree. If you are going to be taking more than 180 credits to get your degree, then you would have a SAP hold placed on your account um, and you could do um, an appeal to uh, have that uh, um, access again to that financial aid. The last thing that I'll just show you here is the borrowing and budgeting. Um, one thing that's really nice is that there's this bottom line estimator that you can use, um, which will show the estimated charges with your estimated financial aid um, and give you information about whether you could expect a refund, um, of whether you might still be owing for the semester. Um, so that can be really helpful 
um, when you're planning your finances for the future. Um, we have these um, kind of other things about information about loan repayment, um, which I don't think are as helpful, especially if you don't have any loans. Um, but I think you could always come to see here, but I think the bottom line estimator is the most um, useful tool that's probably the most used uh, on, on this page. So with that, that's really all I had as far as the general overview. I hope it wasn't too general. Um, and I definitely wanted to leave time for, for any um, questions. I think it's um, a pretty small room. So if you have uh, like just specific questions uh, to your account, I mean, I, I'm free until noon. I mean, we could just stay on and I could look at your account, um, but I'd be happy to answer uh, general questions as well. Um, can you answer maybe um, what's the number one issue students call into your office about? Is there anything that um, students can do <coughs> ahead of, you know, as they're filling out their application, things to consider um, to, uh, so to lessen the uh, confusion maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think just in general, when it comes uh, to financial aid, it's, it's just you want to plan early. So like right now, I would say is the ideal time to start planning and like getting your financial aid in order for fall 2021. You can still receive aid for spring, you can still receive aid for summer, um, but it's going to be potentially stressful if you're selected for verification and um, the the timing, you, you know, you may be getting your financial aid after the tuition due date. So definitely plan ahead. Um, I think above and beyond that, just being aware um, that a lot of these processes have to happen annually. So it's not fill out the FAFSA and then you're done. You have to fill out the FAFSA every single year. Um, the Boise State Scholarship application has to be filled out every single year. Um, and that being the case right now, there's two FAFSA that are open. There's the current FAFSA, which will be for this fall, next spring, and next summer. And then there's the newest FAFSA that went live October 1st. That will be for fall 2021, spring 2022, and summer 2022. Um, when students go to the FAFSA website, the, the, the most prominent one is the newest FAFSA, which is not tied to the spring semester that's coming up. So if you're planning on coming for the spring semester, uh, spring 2021, um, and you haven't filled out a FAFSA yet, um, make sure that you're filling out the correct FAFSA. Um, and honestly, if you're coming for this spring and for next fall, you can just go ahead and fill out both of them um, if you're on that site uh, doing the FAFSA. For the FAFSA, FAFSA for um, fall 21, which will be the application for 21, um, since we don't file taxes until, you know, January through April timeframe 21, um, is it accurate to say that they used the projections from the previous tax, from the previous years, and then mm -hmm. that information is then updated or? Yeah, so that's why we have the special condition process. Uh, I think it was about, I don't even remember now, three or four years ago that they made a change on the FAFSA to use two years uh, prior. So the current FAFSA that just opened, it's, its default steady, setting is that you're using 2019 tax information and you don't have a choice to use other tax information. Um, so most people should have their 2019 uh, taxes filed already. Um, but then if you know, you're know you filing that and things have changed, you could then look at doing that special conditions process through our office and we could potentially update um, the information on your FAFSA, the 2020 tax information. But as a student, you couldn't just be like, oh, I didn't like 2019, I'm gonna use a different year. You have to use 2019 for the newest FAFSA. And then from there, once we get it, we can look at making changes on our end. Anything else that I could uh, help answer? Seems, seems like we're, yeah, we don't have any other questions not through the chat. So thank awesome. you. Awesome. 
I really appreciate going over all the specifics and then um, the basic information um, for, for our students. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, just to kind of uh, close it out, I mean, here's our contact, um, our contact page, like, which right here you can um, like make appointments and things like that. But um, if you do have questions, uh, you can always reach out to us, even though we're not um uh, may not be in person forever we are open currently in office we have the phone number and we have our email i'm um, just generally right now um probably in all ways to contact us email is, is is going to be the slowest we're just receiving so many emails right now so if there's a time like a time constraint to your question like you need to know an answer by tomorrow or by today the best thing is going to be to call us or to, to come in person Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, it's great to meet you guys. And for whenever you're starting or if you're currently a student, I uh, hope the semester's going well and that you have uh, future successful semesters. All right, bye, all. Bye. -bye.